The cheers, the shouts, the love of these fans, these are the rewards for victory. The Philadelphia Adams Professional Soccer Club returned to such cheers on Sunday, August 26, 1973. To get there, they first had to write a new chapter in the history of American sports. The Philadelphia Adams were a fledgling franchise in 1973, born into the ranks of the North American Soccer League at a time when no professional soccer team in the United States could claim any real notoriety. That was a situation they alone would change in 1973. This soccer team would run with Americans, where mostly Europeans and Latin Americans had tread. This soccer team had the only American coach in the league. Al Miller recruited from Hartwick College in upstate New York. And these are some of the Americans on Miller's team. Bob Rigby of Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Bob Smith of Trenton, New Jersey. Barry Bartow of Philadelphia. Lou Meal of Philadelphia. Stanley Startzel of Levittown. And there are others as well. Could they meet the challenge of professional soccer? And could they make Americans love the sport as much as they did? Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Hey there, everybody. How you doing? My name is Tim Hanlon, and this is indeed Good Seats Still Available, our curious little podcast journey each week if you can believe it, into what used to be in professional sports. If that voice at the top of the show sounded familiar, that announcer voice, that sort of voice of God, uh, you are uh, uh, not uh, to be fooled. That is, of course, uh, the dulcet tones, the velvety pipes, if you will, of the uh, late, great John Facenda, known as the voice of God to many NFL films aficionados. But uh, as uh, some of you may know, uh, the NFL film studios uh, were actually in, still are, I believe, uh, just in the outside of uh, Philadelphia in suburban uh, southern New Jersey. And uh, Mr. Facenda, by doing a lot of work there, uh, did also quite a bit of uh, extra work in sports in and around Philadelphia generally. Uh, and uh, that is the sort of lead, as you can sort of uh, hear, uh, into our conversation this week. Uh, with our very special guest, our seventh uh, National uh, Soccer Hall of Famer, uh, the coach of the team uh, in the early 1970s that kind of helped uh, kickstart uh, the North American Soccer League back into uh, some actual uh, living, breathing life after almost a near-death experience, the Philadelphia Adams. Uh, his name is Al Miller, and uh, most soccer fans uh, in this country, of, or pro soccer fans for that matter, will know Al Miller's name. Uh, and uh, and recognize him almost as the sort of quintessential uh, American soccer coach, and and I underline the word American, maybe even capitalize it, uh, as he uh, burst onto the uh, professional soccer scene that the uh, of which ex- actually existed at the time, right? Uh, relatively modest by comparison to today's standards, of course. Uh, but this uh, in 1973, Al Miller inherited, uh, and not for uh, quite a short period of time to get a team together. Uh, a brand new, spanking new franchise uh, in the uh, uh, North American Soccer League, which was, uh, you know, just coming out of uh, uh, its uh, lowest moments, I would argue, in the uh, the years prior, I and mean, almost down to five teams, I think it was, uh, and hired basically as the uh, a first, the first American coach, uh, and uh, believing uh, in a uh, in a group of mostly American uh, players. Uh, to uh, do something quite amazing, and that was uh, to win the North American Soccer League Championship in its very first year, 1973. Uh, that is the starting point of a very interesting uh, and uh, revelatory set of uh, uh, of stories and uh, and history uh, in coaching in this uh, fledgling uh, pro sport of soccer uh, in the United States uh, over what I guess it was 40 years uh, since then. 
Uh, and we get into all of that uh, with our uh, our very special guest, Al Miller. And look, if you're a fan of uh, not only the Philadelphia Adams, which is very uh, integral to the, the history of the professional sport of uh, soccer in Philadelphia, but also uh, the Dallas Tornado, where uh, uh, Al went to uh, after uh, the th- a three-year stint with the, with the Adams and some of the uh, sort of heyday and the glory years of the Dallas Tornado franchise, and of course... Uh, Lamar Hunt features uh, quite prominently in that story, and we'll hear that. Uh, but also, if you're interested in the, uh, you remember a team called the Calgary Boomers? Uh, a very interesting asterisk uh, in the history of the North American Soccer League. We get into that with Al. Uh, he was the coach of that team for its year plus or so. And you'll hear sort of the wink, wink, nod, nod uh, as to why that was uh, sort of shortened, shall we say. Uh, his uh, his time in Calgary, but also then a uh, quite lengthy and uh, prodigious uh, coaching and administrative general management uh, career in indoor soccer, the major indoor soccer league with the Cleveland Force, uh, and then the Cleveland Crunch, and then that team uh, segued into what then became the North uh, North No sorry the NPSL then the National Professional Soccer League. This is the successor of the MISL, uh, and uh, and Al uh, 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 capping off a. A very successful uh, coaching and management career with uh, six championship uh, appearances in the NPSL, uh, three of which yielded uh, NPSL national titles. Uh, all of that uh, is a, a, a very interesting story and a, a, a long and winding one with our very special guest, Al Miller. He the in the National Soccer Hall of Fame, Mr. Miller. Uh, coming up in a couple of seconds, you will enjoy this conversation thoroughly. Al is a tremendous uh, conversationalist, and uh, uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're in for a real treat. Uh, let me get a couple of promotional things out of the way first, of course. However, uh, and we want to thank our friends at SportsHistoryCollectibles.com, where of course you can continue to get 15% off all of your purchases when you use the promo code Good Seats. Yep, that's the promo code Good Seats at SportsHistoryCollectibles.com, and and uh, using uh, this week's episode as a background if you're looking for some. Uh, North American Soccer League stuff. You're going to find quite a bit of it there at SportsHistoryCollectibles.com. But not just that, but you know, plenty of stuff from baseball and football and hockey and uh, and, and golf and and a whole bunch of other sports. Uh, you're going to find lots of great imagery there, a lot of great items. And again, when you find something, you just got to have. By all means, please uh, use early and use often that promo code Good Seats at checkout for fifteen percent off. Again, that's Sports History Collectibles. Com. We thank them for their sponsorship, as always. Uh, and uh, we also thank, as always, our sponsors from our friends at Audible. AudibleTrial.com slash Good Seats. It's the place to go and get your free uh, one month uh, subscription to the service. And of course, your free audiobook download from the vast array of over 180,000 titles to choose from. Why not give it a try? It's uh, basically no risk. Uh, you can cancel it any time, and uh, by using the uh, the little uh, URL that we uh, we like to promote, audibletrial.com slash goodseats, that's the place to go. Give us a little bit of love when you do so. Uh, get a, a taste of the service. Enjoy an audio book. What great, uh, great companion uh, alongside, of course, your favorite podcast, hint, hint, uh, to, uh, you know, kill some time as you're driving across country or you're flying a internationally or whatever you're doing for your vacation needs. Maybe you're, you're stuck in the, in the woods of, uh, you know, Northern, uh, uh, Minnesota. I don't know. You're camping and uh, the fish aren't biting today. Well, hell, why not give a listen to a great audiobook from audible That's audibletrialcom slash good seats. Go out and pick out a book. Will you a title from one of the, uh, you know, just thousands and thousands and thousands of titles. You're going to find one at least. And, um, we, uh, thank you for doing so to get uh, your free trial up and going again audibletrial.com slash good seats give it a try and uh, we appreciate you're doing so we also appreciate you're giving a listen to our uh, our fine and fun conversation uh with let's call him the coach i'm going to nickname him the coach because that's what he is he's a long time and legendary coach of american soccer teams uh especially in the pro ranks and we're going to get into all of those interesting stories here's our my chat our chat uh, with the great al miller Before we sort of get into the uh, the professional world of uh, of the North American Soccer League, maybe you could give our audience a sense of how you became 
in a position to be a soccer coach at the pro level in this country prior with all your uh, your work and, and endeavors? Okay, I'm going to have to try to make a long story short. I went to no, a one-room we schoolhouse. We have plenty of time, Al. Please, go ahead. Okay, I went to a one-room schoolhouse in Pennsylvania, uh, just outside of Hershey, Pennsylvania. And uh, at, at recess, uh, the kids kicked a soccer ball around. When you were about third or fourth grade, you were big enough to pl- get in the game. And uh, and I loved, I loved it. I loved that. And in the spring, we played... Uh, 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 softball. So anyway, I kind of grew up with those two sports, but never saw a game, didn't know what a real game looked like. And uh, in my seventh grade, uh, our teacher decided to have a play day with uh, another uh, one-room schoolhouse. And we went and we had, uh, you know, the wheelbarrow races and running races and all that stuff, which we all participated in. And the, the day culminated with a soccer game, the two schools playing each other, both boys and girls playing. And I scored like six goals or something, and we we won the game. And for the first time ever, I guess I felt some adulation uh, that I had never felt before. Yeah, I was a different person on the walk back, which was about a mile and a half versus the walk over. And uh, uh, I don't know if that affected me, but it stuck in me and – I just fell in love with the game and my father bought me a ball, a leather ball for Christmas. And I wore that out, hit it against our garage door and practicing, et cetera. And, uh, when it was time to go to high school, uh, when I graduated from the eighth grade and time to go to my high school, I knew a lot of kids because I played a little, uh, not little league, but it was, it was called uh, junior legion, I think, or, or, uh, Connie Mack baseball at that time. And uh, so in the summertime, you know, I'd play in those games and I knew these kids. I couldn't wait to to go to school with them. And uh, unfortunately, the school was overcrowded. As, so as a result, uh, my parents had two choices. One was to go to my school, which would have been Jonestown High School. And the other one was to go to Hershey High School, which was the elite high school in the area and the elite community in the area. And since my mother had worked for the Hershey Chocolate Factory, uh, that was the uh, school of choice. So I had a bus uh, like 14 miles to Hershey every day and uh, couldn't play sports. They didn't have soccer. They had football, which I was unfamiliar with, and went out for the baseball team and got cut within like 30 minutes. Uh, Never got looked at. Uh, You know, he knew all the local kids, didn't know me. And... uh, Anyway, I was uh, uh, sportless, and in my uh, in my sophomore year in high school, Reverend Bob Richards came on a barnstorming tour after he had won the gold medal and 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 pole vault at 15 feet, first time anybody ever did it in history. Bob Richards gave the most inspiring sports talk that I had ever heard, touched me completely. I rode home on the school bus that day and went straight to my father and said, I'm changing. I would like to change schools. Are you okay with it? And he said, of course. And so I ended up transferring to Jonestown High School. And here comes the revelation that I think is pretty sensational. I went out for the soccer team, made the team, made the starting 11, and ended up playing in my first game, which was the first game I actually ever saw first organized soccer game I ever saw I I actually played in played it under the lights in a in a minor league baseball stadium which the uh, St. Louis Cardinals built in in uh, just outside of our community and gave it to the school to to utilize when the when baseball season was not in which was the fall and we drew big crowds so soccer was a big game for that school I got I got caught up in it. I was a, became a star player in my senior year. We won the regional championship and went as far as we could go back in those days. And I scored the winning goal in the in the regional championship game. And a German referee uh, uh, came after the game and asked me if I would consider playing for his amateur club in the Philadelphia League. Um, 
the town that he his team was in, it was called the uh, the the uh, Liederkranz, uh, German Liederkranz, which means singing and sports society. And uh, they came and picked me up, took me to uh, first practice. I never saw so many good soccer players in my life, never had any kind of formal practice like that before. And I fell in love with it. And so I commuted back and forth to practice and played in the Philadelphia League and soon became uh, the only American star uh, starting on that team. More came later. And as and as a result, um, uh, I was introduced, uh, I guess what you would call a much higher quality of soccer. And it was during that time, two years later, I was, a, I was not a good student in high school. It was during that time that he suggested, why didn't you go to college? And I said, never gave it a thought. He said, you should be a... You should be a coach. You're a natural born leader. He said, I'm going to have the coach contact you. Well, back in those days, the coach contacted you by sending you an application. I filled it out. I was married and had a child. Uh, I was working in a grocery store that my father had purchased just for me, really, and my wife to run. I was tied down 24 hours a day with it. And and anyway, I applied, talked my way into college and became a physical education teacher and chose to coach soccer. And that's how it all started. Well, so this is so uh, remind our audience, this is circa early mid 1950s. You're kind of sort of giving this was 19. I started college in 1956 at East Stroudsburg State University, which is in the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania. It was an incredible undertaking. I, I certainly, I, I had to talk my way into with the admissions director, uh, who, who interviewed me, looked at my paper and said, "What are you doing here? You're you're not qualified." And I got up and you know said, "You don't understand how important this is to me. I got a wife. I got a child. I made a momentous decision to go to college. Uh, it's going to be a humongous under, undertaking for me financially." but I got to do it. It's, it's my calling. And he looked at me and he said, I'm going to give you a chance. Don't let me down. And, uh, um, that's, that's how it, that's how it began. And of course I was light years above the typical college player having played in that, that Philadelphia league for two years, uh, because they, most of those players were foreign. A lot of them, very good foreign players many with pro backgrounds. And so, um, you know, I, I got schooled in that league for two years before I went to college. And so when I went to college, I was a kind of a man among boys. Well, that actually, so that leads me to the question, right? So, uh, circa that time, right? Uh, you're really, I mean, for any sort of, shall we say quality level of soccer at any, you know, uh, at any, you know, at any perch, whether it's, you know, at the amateur level or, or high school or college or whatever, there was pro with the uh, admittedly not so professional American Soccer League at that time. Um, ethnic backgrounds and importation, shall we say, of the sport was really quite predominant. I mean, there really by there really wasn't any sort of pure play American, quote unquote, you know. Oh, uh, no. Right. Tim, every, every Sunday that we had a game. We had two. We had two competitions going. One was the, the the soccer game, and the other was the ethnic war. I mean, when when my club played the German Hungarians, it was a war because they hated each other, and the fans hated each other. And uh, it was it, it was uh, I I didn't I I didn't have those feelings, but my teammates certainly did, and lots of times you know fights erupted, etc. It was. It was a survival of the fittest, and we certainly didn't play on great fields. Uh, it was it was a it was a, a, a an education in itself of international relations for me. And to be honest with you, I found it very fascinating. And later, I think it helped me in my uh, in my uh, pro debuts because I kind of understood a lot better all the different cultures of the foreign element of players. Because uh, 
we were we would be riding to games on a Sunday morning, driving down to Philadelphia, which was a you know an hour an hour and a half drive, and uh, during that uh, that drive, guys would be telling me how they escaped from Hungary, uh, you know, across a river with people shooting at them and their mother getting killed or hanging onto a horse or whatever. I mean, incredible stories that were just mesmerizing. And these were now my teammates. So it was a, it was a really interesting time. And I would say this, in all honesty, in my experience, certainly high school and college soccer is not what was the ba- was the real foundation i think of of soccer at that time it was the it was the uh, the foreign element the ethnic clubs that formed all across uh you know the large cities of america that uh, chicago philadelphia new york etc that really uh was a tremendous foundation to the game now, this is going to be ironic, right, as we get into deeper into your, your career, especially at the pro level, right, because uh, as history looks back, right, you you, you actually became uh, far well known or better known for actually being the strongest advocate for the Americanization of the sport and the budding American player, uh, you know, outside of that ethnic root, uh, rooting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I felt that we could compete because we were good enough athletes Although we didn't grow up with a game like, uh, like uh, you know, the foreigners did, but I I felt that we could we could learn the game and we could compete with them and we did, and uh, you know that that club with a lot of good players I became their leading goal scorer for a bunch of years and then later when I moved to New York and started coaching in college I played for another German club up there that was quite successful and had. A, actually better players than the the team I played for in Philadelphia because the New York league, I think was a bit stronger. And, uh, I was, I was a top goal scorer there as well. So, you know, it was, it was one of those, one of those situations where I guess I always felt that the American was, was, was cast aside and didn't really get the, the opportunities. And so when I got my opportunity to coach my first pro team, uh, I played a lot of Americans and gave them a shot. And fortunately for me and for them, they came through like gangbusters and we won the league, won the championship game, and the rest is history. I mean, uh, I became, uh, I was the first American to coach in the pro league and win the, win the championship. And, and as a result, you know, uh, Sports Illustrated picked up on that and, I, I, part of my fame, I guess, uh, was, was the fact that I was the champion of America. And I still feel that way today, Tim. One of the things that bugs me, uh, sitting on the sidelines watching now with the MLS, is I think truthfully that if, if we could really uh, take it apart, the MLS has helped CONCACAF teams from Central America more than it's helped America. I think it's actually hurt American in many respects because it's made the CONCACAF pay, players better. And and consequently, uh, I feel like uh, maybe we, we haven't... I, I always felt that if we have a pro league, we should have, if, there's, if there's 15 teams in the league, there should be 15 American center forwards. 15 American goalkeepers, 15 American playmaker midfielders, etc. And one of them is going to turn out to be the best. One of them is going to turn out to be the best goal scorer, best goalkeeper, etc. And then that should be our national team. But if you only have one or two Americans uh, as, as center forwards or, or strikers, uh, I don't know if that's really development. Well, th- that brings up a whole host of, of questions, and I, you know, we're going to use that sort of as, a, as the coda to our conversation, but maybe we tackle it now because, you know, in, in some respects, right, and, and I think you're uniquely qualified given your, your heritage and, and your contributions to the sport over the years, especially, you know, when there was no quote-unquote prototypical American player. Um, you know, the, the, it gets to, I think, a bit of what is MLS all about, right? And I, I do think that there is an existential 
uh, debate, right? I mean, a lot of it is about growing the sport, sure. Uh, there's a lot of economics involved, of course. Uh, it's it's uh, in its own way trying to uh, bring itself into, you know, uh, equilibrium, I guess, with the global game and, and obviously the transfers and the players and the talent, and that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, to your to your point earlier, right, what is what is a domestic league uh, ostensibly set up to do? And, and in some respects, in many respects, frankly, and in a lot of circles, it should be about helping uh, said country uh, improve its game, especially on the world stage. Um, and, and without sort of, I guess, some protections or uh, some uh, advantages, I guess, to uh, or deference, I guess, to the Native American player, not native native period American player uh, although I'm sure there's some some Native Americans who, who should uh, be players as well uh to be uh, improve the quality of the of the American game uh you know by playing more Americans well I I think I think uh you know if you ask the powers to be they're saying look uh we have a league and there's a league for Americans to survive in and if they're good enough, they can play. And and that's a good answer. I mean, uh, that's better than no league. However, if you really analyze the structure of the league, if, if I was hired to coach any one of those teams today, I would have to make a choice. Do I want to take the top American goal scorer, the top national team goal scorer prospect, uh, let's say Pulisic it would be that guy. Would I would I want to take him to to uh, uh, be the, my top guy for my career to survive as a coach? So I'm a winner, or would I rather have somebody who's uh, been a proven goal scorer in Germany or Brazil or Argentina or wherever? And you know, I think the answer would be I probably lean towards the foreign player because. They, they have been the main go-to guy on a big club somewhere in a big league. Whereas Pulisic at, in his country is doing very well by starting, but he's certainly not the go-to guy at Dortmund. And, and there, therein lies the dilemma that I've always had is if you, if you go with the Pulisic's, uh, and and the American kids, uh, you know, can you win with them? Can you survive with them? And the answer is probably not. Uh, somebody might have a, a, a big coaching advantage over you if they bring in, back in my day, Gordi- uh, Giorgio Canalia. I mean, this guy was a sensation in a country, Italy, that had great uh, soccer history, and he was a big, big timer on the world scene. So when he came to America, uh, to compare any American goal scorer at that time to him, you would have to be crazy if you selected an American over him, and and or over a Pele, or over a Beckenbauer, or over a Carlos Alberto or over Johan Niskin, and on and on and on. They had the world all-star team, practically. Well, but that, that was, that, they were also coming at some level of their prime. You could make an argument maybe on the sort of the beginning of the downslope of, of their careers, right, Pelé in particular. But, you know, still, and this is sort of, I think, something, and, and we'll get into this, I think, as we go back to your, your, your starting of, of your pro coaching career. You know, I think you get into... You know, how much, what is the balance there, right? I mean, the old North American Soccer League, and I don't know what year that started, but the, the sort of the, there must be three North Americans on the field at all times, right? At least there was some tip of right. the hat to, you know, we need to help grow the sport in this country, right? But in some respects, maybe it's almost, you know, maybe it's a reverse of that today where there's a, you know, a, I will call it a quota, but, you know, I don't know if it's, I don't know if a full free market really helps the American player, right, by, by the ability to have complete foreign players in this league. Um, where is the balance, I guess? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if I can answer that. Uh, uh, my crazy thought process is that wouldn't it be wonderful if, if, if we had, you know, 24 pro teams playing in, in across America, this big country of ours, 
and all 24 players at each position would be an American. Uh, would we be, would we be creating a better national team, uh, a stronger national team? I believe so. But I also learned in my career that the importation of foreign players back, certainly back in my days when I started in 1973, I mean, if you brought the right type of guys in, which I did, I, I looked for character. I looked for leadership qualities. I looked for guys that were humble, that I knew would come here and do a job for me and would, would accept the American guys and try to help them. And the guys that I brought in in Philadelphia, they were phenomenal uh, role models for, for starting my American college kids out in a pro career. And so you, so you need that balance as well. I mean, it's, it's really a difficult, complex situation. All right, well, I, I, really, I almost feel like Italy, for example, that has so much money in the game now, has brought in so many foreign players that it's actually hurt their national team. Yeah, well, I, I think mean, they're. I think they might have felt that. Well, uh, you could also make the argument you know, on the U.S. The U.S. national team, right? You're talking about two countries that are looking on the outside, looking in this this tournament. Right? Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure. So I I don't know, have the answer to your question, Tim. I I don't know what is the perfect formula. Uh, I guess if you're the commissioner of the MLS. The number one formula is making the, the sport successful in the country, however you have to do it for the ownership and for the sport itself. If you're the United States Soccer Federation, now it's a whole different thing. I think you almost have to be fighting for the American player. And now you also have, I mean, you every everybody that I've heard talk about it when you bring a foreign coach in, the first thing they think about is, where can I go find German players played in the German league that, that are, have some American citizenship that can come and play for my national team? You know, that's always going to happen because I think there's no question if, a, if an American kid is starting in Dortmund or at Bayern Munich, if he's a starting player there, He's going to be better than a starting player out of college, etc. You know, I just think there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. No, for sure. Um, well, let's let's dial the way back machine to, to seventy three, right? Because this is I, I'm really okay. curious. I want to get a sense of, and I think some of the other issues that we're sort of uh, broaching on now will come out even more into the fore in a minute. But um, give me give our audience a sense of how the whole opportunity of the Philadelphia Adams uh, presented itself circa 72, 73 in the first place. Okay. I was coaching at Hartwick college. Uh, we had a, you know, a national fame. We were in a top 10 in the, in the country for all my six years there. Uh, I was a promoter. So we had big crowds. We, we had the community involved. Um, you know, we, our games were broadcast over radio. We charged admission to the games. We had, halftime shows, etc. And and uh, my athletic director was Jim Constanti, who was the MVP of the National League in 1950 as a pitcher for the Phillies. So he understood my professionalism attitude and, and certainly supported it. And as a result, we built a, a heck of a program at Hartwick in a, in a college that only had 1,500 students. And, and so uh, I was selected by the Federation at that time, uh, when Detmar Crummer came over, I went to the first uh, uh, coaching school and, and he met me for the first time. I met him for the first time. He kind of picked me out and, and asked me if I could, would be his assistant to travel around the country in the summer and, and help put on the coaching schools, which I did. Uh, I, I think it was mainly through that and my reputation as a college coach that I was called upon by the league. They were starting to promote me. So whenever there was a coaching job open, they would promote me. They would throw my name in the hat. Uh, I went to two different interviews, two different pro clubs. Both of them rejected me and picked a foreign coach. 
And I felt which, like that was sorry, just... Do you, do you remember which clubs those were? Yeah, it was St. Louis Steamers uh, uh, and the um, Rochester Lancers. St. St. Louis Stars? St. Louis Stars, excuse me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, get, my, get my names mixed up over the years. Any, anyway, um, both times they picked a foreign coach, and that was okay. I mean, I understood that. That's the way it was. And the, the 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 rap on me was that I didn't know anybody in 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 England. So consequently, if you were a player or a coach in England, you knew all the the the, the personnel over there. It would be easy for you to recruit. I didn't know anybody allegedly, and so consequently, I I they 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 saw that as a weakness in me. And and that was that was what was explained to me. Philadelphia comes along, and the coach. I mean, the owner, Tom McCluskey, wanted an American coach. He was, a, he was a newcomer to the game. He didn't understand all the foreign element, et cetera. He was a football guy all the way. And, and uh, he, was, he was really uh, setting himself up to get an NFL franchise. And Lamar Hunt talked him into buying a soccer franchise. And so I was invited as the as the token American, but the actual general manager that he had hired was promoting John Best, who was an English coach. And and as a result, when I went for the interview, he and I hit it off big time. I liked him immediately, and he told me later that he liked me immediately. He decided to hire me and offered me the job I jumped at the opportunity, obviously, because that's really what I wanted. I wanted to check the pro box. I thought I could do it. And I, the rest is history. I, I went there in February. The team, they had no name, no practice facility, no, no stadium to play, and no, no name of the team, no, no uh, logo, and no pl- zero players. So my job was to try to put all those pieces together with the help of Bob Ellinger, who was now the new general manager because the other one got fired. And, and as a result, uh, we put this team of some foreign players that I recruited to come over and, and uh, my American boys, and we ended up winning the, winning the league and, and did it in really big-time fashion. We played in a big stadium. By that time, the league was struggling it was dwindling, crowds were down, and all of a sudden we come in. We had 36,000, I think, at, the, at our semifinal game when we, when we beat uh, Toronto, uh, and we were just rolling. And then we played Dallas in the final at, 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 in Texas Stadium and beat them 2 nothing. And, uh, you know, I ended up getting coach of the year. The team was on front page of... Sports Illustrated, first time any time any soccer team ever got any mention in Sports Illustrated, and uh, you know my career was launched. All right, just when it was getting interesting, let's uh, let's bring this uh, to a grinding halt, shall we? Ah, just kidding. Uh, we got to pay the bills around here, and uh, our friends at Audible have been very helpful in attempting to allow us to pay some of those bills, and uh, we want to call them out now uh, and remind you that uh, a free audiobook download is yours for the taking, and also a free one-month uh, subscription to the service uh, of Audible at audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Again, audibletrial.com slash goodseats for your free one-month trial of the Audible service and interestingly, most interestingly, a free audiobook download for you to enjoy. 180,000 titles and growing uh, every day to choose from, and there's uh, absolutely no excuse to not find at least one title amongst that uh, cavernous uh, selection uh, available to you that uh, you won't find to be enjoyable and uh, and good for the soul, including uh, a couple of books that might be interesting to our audience. And yes, some new ones, frankly, uh, that I'm finally listening to. One that I'm listening to right now, uh, is by Carson Cunningham. It's narrated by Paul Bamer, and it's called Underbelly Hoops, Adventures in the CBA, a.k.a. the Crazy Basketball Association, which is really, of course, about the Continental Basketball Association, which for many years 
was sort of this ragtag minor league uh, of the NBA. And that's uh, it's a book I'm about two chapters into right now. And uh, hopefully maybe a guest will get uh, for a future episode. Also uh, in my queue, next up uh, is another guest that I'd like to get. Uh, and her book that she wrote is also uh, narrated by her. Her name is Jeannie Buss. And of course, Jeannie is the daughter of Jerry Buss, of course, the uh, a wildly successful founder of the Los Angeles Lakers and the LA Forum. And Jeannie is, uh, is clearly today the brains behind uh, the Los Angeles Lakers today. Uh, she and her brothers were uh, active, of course, in things like, along with her father, uh, World Team Tennis, uh, the Major Indoor Soccer League with the LA Lasers, all kinds of stuff. So uh, her book is next on my list. That's called Laker Girl. And that too is available on Audible. And again, it's one of the uh, the many thousands of titles that you can choose from uh, when you go to audibletrial.com slash goodseats. And again, you too can get your free audiobook download to give it a try, perhaps one of those two, or perhaps one of the other 180,000 titles uh, available to you as well. Uh, give it a try, audibletrial.com slash goodseats. Thanks for listening and back to our conversation. I think actually, so we had Kyle Rowe Jr. on uh, a number of months ago, and uh, uh, the way he uh, uh, tells it, and it, it seems logical, but I'd love to hear your opinion of it too. You know, that's uh, it's my understanding that obviously Kyle wrote, which obviously, you know, you uh, wound up coaching uh, in the years later when we get to Dallas in, in a few minutes, but um, it was, I think the sports, if I'm not mistaken, if I re- recall our conversation correctly, Sports Illustrated was almost... Uh, almost uh, expecting Dallas to kind of win that game. And, and obviously the story of Kyle Rowe Jr., who was sort of emerging as sort of a an early star in the in the North American Soccer League. But you kind of upset all those plans by going to Dallas, Texas Stadium uh, and winning it uh, outright uh, in their home uh, stadium. Uh, this is true. I mean, it was one of the discussions in the locker room because before the game, they were taking they were they had a photographer on the field and he was doing diving headers, et cetera, and, and in the warm-up time. And, and uh, our players picked up on that, and uh, everybody was making a joke out of, well, they'll be taking our – they need to take our picture because we're going to win this damn thing, you know. And I was loving it because it was just it was just one more thing. Uh, and, and I had a young kid by the uh, name of Chris Dunleavy, 23-year-old uh, center back from, from England, Southport, England, and he, we gave him the the assignment to, to Mark wrote, and uh, oh my God, he totally dominated him in the, in this game, and and as a result, you know, it was kind of his little claim to fame in the game because uh, of his dominance, and then later he, his picture was they still use wrote picture on the front, but it was uh, it was uh, him uh, jumping over the top of Road heading a ball which became the cover. Well, give me a sense of how you, uh, so fe- we're talking about February of 73 when you sort of came into the team uh, and the league, you know, season started, I guess, what, in, in later that spring. C- give, it, give our audience a sense of sort of how you scramble to get a team in place. I mean, it just seems incredibly short amount of time to get something up and yeah. running, let alone win a champion. Well, the first thing we did is we got the stadium. Uh, I got an office in the stadium and we could use it you know, for tryouts, et cetera. And I, I, I had a couple of open tryouts. Um, uh, I found some, I found some American players. We had a really great draft. Uh, we got, we got uh, two players in a draft that, uh, that were terrific players, Bobby Smith and, and Bob Rigby, our goalkeeper. And, and so those two were key building blocks. Uh, I selected about, five other Philadelphia area players. And uh, my plan my plan was uh, all along is that somehow or another, I w- back in those days, we loaned players. We signed a loan agreement with the team in, in England or wherever. And we would, we would loan the player. Basically what we were doing is we were taking the player off of their payroll so they were saving money. The players would come over here and play for the summer, and they'd go back just in time for the preseason in England. And so we, we, uh, I went, I went, I went to England. Francisco Marcus, who was one of my p- 
players at a college at at, uh, in, at Hartwick by now had created this foreign tour program and knew a lot of coaches in, in England and particularly in Southport. And, and he helped me in this situation. And, and I ended up signing three players from Southport Football Club, which was a fourth division team. They had just won the fourth division championship and were promoted to the third division. I picked what I thought that were the three top players or two top goal scorers, Jimmy Fried and Andy Proven. And the other one was Chris Dunleavy, who I just talked about, the center back. So that was my first three signings. And then I went from there to Liverpool, because Southport's right close to Liverpool, met the famous Bill Shankly. I asked him if he'd do me a favor. He loved America. And he, he loved talking to me because I was an American, wanted to know all, everything about how the league was doing, etc. And I asked him if he'd help me and give me a couple of players. He said, I'll give you one. And he gave me Roy Evans, left back, who was my MVP for the year by far, one of the best quality players we had, because he was playing at a first division team in Liverpool, one of the world famous teams. And he wasn't a starter, but he was a young young player who had had some, had some first team games. And later Roy became the manager of Liverpool and, and was there when, they, when the, they had the terrible tragedy. But, but anyway, those were my first four signings. And Phil Wisdom, the, the commissioner of the league, told me about a player by the name of Derek Trevis, who was playing for Lincoln City. Uh, I went there and met the manager. The manager later became the, the uh, manager of England, uh, Graham. And, and uh, so anyway, I, I convinced him to let Derek come over. Back in those days, if a player gave great service and he was on the edge of his career, managers would give them a free transfer so that they could go and make some money someplace. And I signed Derek and made him my team captain because he had great leadership qualities and just a great personality, big sense of humor, but uh, kind of an imposing figure, another center back. And, and he was really a key factor in, in our success as well. So I had five terrific players there as a start. And my plan then was, since they couldn't come over and practice with us in preseason, we would take our preseason over there. So I rented Lillyshaw, which is the, was the home of the England Training Center. And we set up base there and had training there. And the, the English players came and played a few games with us. We played uh, practice games against uh, the big first division teams, reserve teams. And everybody was willing to help us, and, and, and we set this tour up, and it was very successful. And one night in Lillyshaw, this Scottish guy shows up like at 11 o'clock at night. I was actually in bed already. And, uh, and anyway, his name was George O'Neill. And he said he played for the Celtics and that he'd, he'd, he'd like to try out. And I said, fine, come the next day. And he trained with us for a couple of days. And I p stuck him in a game. And he was a warrior. He was, he was a, a, a guy that just fit into what we were looking for in left, in left side midfield. And then George became an integral part of the team as well. So it all kind of fell together, the American kids loved the English guys, and by the time the English guys arrived in, in America to start our league, uh, we had some familiarity. I wouldn't say it was a great preseason, because it wasn't, but by the time I had a couple of weeks with these guys, uh, our fitness level was exceptional with the Americans. The English players were coming off of a long, tough season. I had to balance that in there. But we got it right, and uh, uh, the first game we lost in St. Louis. Second game we tied it home to Dallas, and then from there on in we went undefeated. We we played tremendous for the rest of the year, and there were a couple of critical moments. Uh, my first team goalkeeper gets injured doing a clinic of all things, jumps up in the air, and a kid rolls a ball under and he lands on it, and and does his knee. 
And uh, I had signed my back. We had limited budgets for players back in those days. I signed my backup goalkeeper from Hartwick College as my backup keeper because I loved the kid. And he came in and did a phenomenal job and helped us win six games while while our first goalkeeper was out injured. So, I mean, it was it was a fairy tale season. Everything fell together. Fry and Proven were scoring goals in abundance, and our defense was, was outstanding. Goalkeeping was outstanding. And bottom line is the American kids were, were getting better every day. They were getting more confidence every day. The team was growing every day. And we just, we just from, from day one, uh, we were a force to be reckoned with. And by the time the season was over, we ended up winning it. Descri- describe the league play uh, and the, the various stadia uh, and the, the, uh, the conditions, right? Because uh, you were also playing in the vet, which is relatively new at the time. Uh, I believe yeah. Bolt, or at least had a heavy hand in by uh, Tom McCluskey, who was a, uh, a, a real estate uh, a construction magnate uh, by trade. So yeah, he, he, a, he built it. He built that stadium. But yeah. I, I, the fuzzy concrete, I mean, I, big cap. <laughs> That's just, what it was. Sense. Yeah. So give well, me some I'll, I'll just tell you one funny story. The first practice we had, uh, Derek Travis is standing uh, in the center circle and Bob Rigby, our goalkeeper, is going to punt a ball out to him. And the ball lands in front of Travis, and Travis is standing there ready to, you know, control it. And the ball bounced like 20 feet over his head. And he looked at, uh, at that ball and, and went and got a hold of it and held it in his hands. And he goes, what the bloody hell kind of ball are we playing with? And it was a... It was a <laughs> It was a spall. I think it was spalling. Uh, uh, no, it was a miter. M i t r e miter ball that was hard as a rock, which was the league ball at that time. And on that astroturf, which was nothing but a little cover over concrete, I mean, it took some doing to learn how to how to play there, you know. And with the rounded, beveled, you know, uh, for drainage purposes. I mean, everything was new to the to the players, the English players, uh, the American players. They didn't they, they, stuff like that didn't bother them because they were just so excited to be playing. But there was a hell of an adjustment for the American or for the foreign players. And how about uh, how about the reception of the team and the league? Obviously, having been through some very dark days, right down to five teams and of just a few years. Well, as a the, team the league, the league was it was a house of cards back in those days. I I didn't know that when I came in, or I probably wouldn't have come in. Uh, but it was a house of cards, and and we were we were the new kid on the block. And to be honest with you, and I I, I say this not braggingly, I think it's a true story. Our success story brought all the new clubs into the league. And then the following year, four new teams came into the league. So the league was launching. It was happening. And, and so that's, that happened. And then the Cosmos go sign Pele. And that happens. So within three years of my 1973 team, all kinds of incredible things are happening uh, to the league that's giving it publicity, big crowds all of a sudden start appearing everywhere. And it wasn't just Philadelphia playing in big stadiums anymore. The whole league was going professional. When I first began, there were a couple of times we played in, in pretty crappy little stadiums, you know, high school stadiums. Uh, Fort Lauderdale was playing in a high school football stadium, Lockhart Stadium. Big crowds, exciting crowds, but it was still a high school football stadium. The locker rooms, etc. It certainly wasn't professional like Veterans Stadium that we were used to. Uh, so, you know, I, I give Philadelphia a lot of credit for really launching the NASL into what it later would become, a 24-team league spread across North America, you know, uh, with the exception of Canada, of course, but Canadian teams, and it was flourishing. Unfortunately, I guess I would have to say, history speaks louder than than words. Uh, 
they went too fast because the, all the owners that came in weren't as sincere as the original ones who were trying to survive. And these guys, uh, you know, it was a fly-by-night investment. Now, let me let me buy a team in the NASL. Oops, we don't like it. We're not making money. We're losing money. I'm out. And so it was a, it was craziness back in those days. And, um, you know, it was just a matter of time until it went bust. So, uh, give me a sense of 74 and 75 after coming off of that, uh, you know, inaugural high of 73, right? I'm mean, on a personal level, on a professional level, on a league level, on a team level. I mean, you, you knocked it out of the park on all four of those accounts. Uh, 74 and 75, uh, an expected uh, sort of lull or or sort of maybe and, and give me a sense of sort of that. And and I guess McCloskey got uh, kind of uh, tired of it at the end of 75 for whatever reasons. Um, yeah, well, give me a, sense well of those a, cup, a couple of things, a couple of things went wrong and, and I'm, I'm responsible for for some of them. OK, uh, one of the things that went wrong was that I fell in love with those guys I mean, when you get a group of guys that play for you the way they played for me and gave so much to win a championship, you can't cut any of them. I mean, I couldn't. I, I was too nice of a guy. If you're, I, one of the things I had to learn to really be a good professional coach was you have to be ruthless. You have to, you have to make hard, tough decisions. And what happened in year two Everybody looked at our team, and now keep in mind, my best players, I had one guy that was a reserve player on a first division team, and all the other guys were fourth division pros that I brought over. Okay, fourth division. All of a sudden, guys were signing first, second, third division players. Why? They're better. They're stronger. And so the, anybody that was building a team uh, and and every year you you can you had the opportunity to rebuild your team because you you weren't guaranteed you were going to get the same loan players back so you 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 rebuilt the team every year i didn't do that that was a big mistake my guys were getting long in tooth they were getting old and they were now they had to play two full years with no breaks that, that's tough for a, a senior player, you know, mentally and physically. And so we were not as good in year two and three as we were in one. And by the time I learned all of this, it was too late. Uh, that was not my cause for leaving Philadelphia. It was not the cause for Tom McCloskey to drop the team. Tom was, was going through a very difficult divorce. He was, he was Catholic, Irish Catholic. That was taboo. It was a tough thing that he was managing in his life, personal life. And he had a private talk with me and told me that his lawyers had advised him that he had to get rid of the team. I don't know if you know this or not, but Tom actually was the first owner of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was awarded that NFL franchise and had to give it up for the same reasons. Very interesting. That's very interesting. Well, uh, so that then I guess begot or begat uh, the then the sale of the team to these Mexican owners. What we talked about with Doug Verb uh, on a previous conversation, which sounds like it was just a, an unbelievable com comedy of errors uh, in 76, ironically, during the bicentennial year. And we, yeah. I urge our listeners to go. Well, I, did, I, I, I can honestly say I don't know too much about that story because – uh, when Tom McCloskey decided to, to sell the team, he invited me to his office for breakfast. And we sat down and we had a man-to-man -man talk. And, and I'll, I'll tell you something uh, Tom, uh, Tom did. Uh, this is the kind of guy he was. He said, Al, I'm devastated. I got to sell the team. And I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about you than I am about me. And I need to help you. I don't want you to get hurt by coming with me and then me folding the team or selling the team. And he picked up the phone and called Lamar Hunt right in front of me and said, Al Miller 
I'm I'm going to be selling the team. I need to look after Al Miller. Can you help me? And Lamar said, I'll get back to you. And he did. And Lamar invited me to interview for the team in Dallas. I, I actually refused the first time he called because Ron Newman was the coach of, of his team in Dallas. And I didn't know what was happening there, but they were getting ready to fire Ron. And, and I didn't know that. And I said to Lamar, I, I, in good conscience, I could not interview for a team where a, a guy w- was already in place. I didn't feel comfortable with that. And then he, he, uh, he said, we're going to be relieving Ron of his duties uh, next week. Uh, will you come for an interview? And I said, if that happens, I will. And I did. And they hired me on the spot to take Ron Newman's place at Dallas. That's how I ended up going to Dallas, thanks to Tom McCloskey and Lamar Hunt. Very interesting. Uh, before we get into Dallas, uh, you did, though, have a nice cup of coffee with the U.S. national team in 75 around that time. Um, well, actually, what happened after after we won, I became the, you know, the, so so to speak, the American darling of coaches. <laughs> and I can tell you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm writing my memoirs as, as we speak here. And, and one of the things that I, that I wrote in there is that I remember I had more pressure put on me by my fellow colleagues in the college ranks because all of them were either writing to me or, or calling me and wishing me well and telling me how important it was that I succeed because I was the first American. And so I felt all the pressure of them on my back that first year in Philadelphia. And thank God I did succeed because it was not long thereafter that a whole bunch of them became coaches in the, in the league. Hubert Vogelsinger, who was a coach at Yale, Dan Wood, who was a coach at Cornell and, 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 and others to follow. So, uh, you know, I felt, I felt that, that pressure and, uh, it it was one of it was one of those times, uh, Tim, when you know things just happen for reasons. I guess beyond your control. I I I certainly felt the pressure from them, but I had my own pressure just trying to put a team together. And I can honestly tell you that at the end of that season, I was so exhausted, and I was in London on a rec- on a recruiting trip. I'll tell you who was trying to sign. I was trying to sign Bobby Moore, the the captain of England, who had just won the World Cup in '66, right? Sure. sure. And I was trying to sign him. Had dinner with him. Actually, my daughter was teaching uh, on a on a foreign teaching t- t- year in in London, and her and I had uh, dinner with Bobby and his agent, uh, business manager, and um, that's what I was doing. And I get a phone call in my hotel room. And it was from, it was from Tom McCluskey, and he said, Phil Wisdom had called him, and they want me to coach the national team. They're taking a trip to Italy and Poland. And I got to tell you, uh, you know, Italy and Poland were two of the best teams in the world of those in those days. Uh, great uh, Dania from Poland, and of course Canalia and all those great Italian players. And I said, are you kidding me to go there in February would be insane because there's no way I want to coach that team because first of all, the players, the American players, they won't be playing it. And in August, they're finished playing playoffs are over. They're done. Where are they going to be playing from now from then until February? So I, I turned it down. And then Phil Wisdom called me. And then Tom McCluskey called me back and said, look, they're putting a lot of pressure on me. Uh, you really need to go. And I said, Tom, this could, this could be my demise. <laughs> this isn't a feather in my hat. This, this could be my demise. I, I, I don't really want to go. I ended up going for Tom McCluskey, to be honest with you, and Phil Wisdom. And it was, it was probably... It was probably one of my great experiences of a lifetime, and it was probably one of my worst experiences of a lifetime because 
players weren't fit. They weren't good enough. We had no preparation time together. It was a disaster. Uh, your uh, spell lasted how long, though, and how many games? Only two, three? We, we played, uh, I think we played four games while we were there. Played Italy, Poland, and then we played uh, another team in Italy, Pescara, which was a beach resort in the wintertime. And I think we, oh, and we played, uh, I think we played the Poland under 20, 23 team, their Olympic team. Lost, lost all the games. That was it. I was persona non grata after that. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I mean, it's not, it's not like the team was, uh, you know, uh, it, it was on the verge of getting into the World Cup and uh, being a world-dominating uh, 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 club. No, right? but that's how it was back then. They took trips just for money purposes. You know, they got, they got uh, appearance fees for doing that. So it was keeping the Federation alive. So I could understand the administrators thinking it was just the people that got involved that were, I think, were harmed. I mean, it was a great experience for me. I mean, I, God, I loved it. I mean, playing in, in Rome in, in the Olympic Stadium in front of 80,000 people, coaching, sitting on that bench, that was phenomenal. But it was it was like going taking going through the crucible, uh, sitting there watching Canalia score six goals. All right. Well, let's talk about Dallas. So you came back. You're in '76 in Dallas, and uh, and obviously Lamar Hunt. Obviously the uh, uh, even by that time, right, the patron saint of of the NASL. And we've had numerous conversations where uh, the intersection of uh, his passion, interest, connections, uh, his uh, uh, determination, I guess. Uh, has led to sort of lots of things. So maybe you can give our audience a sense of uh, the three or four years you're uh, in Dallas. Um, you're you're uh, you're with uh, Kyle Rowe Jr. You've got uh, uh, you know an interesting nucleus of, of players there, and and some uh, some successes, and uh, maybe not so su- uh, sub successes uh, in in the Big D. Well, it was it was very interesting. First of all, I want to tell you, Lamar Hunt was one of the greatest people I ever met in my life. I was honored honored to be employed by him twice, uh, once for six years, six seasons in Dallas, and then later with the Tampa Bay Rowdies, which he was 50% owner, brought me back in into the game. But uh, he was a phenomenal person, and one of the things he was, he was extremely honest, and he sat me down when I came there, and he said, "Listen, I have enough money." At that time, he was a multi-billionaire, not millionaire, billionaire. He said, I have enough money to buy the best players in the world. And he said, I could make you the greatest coach in the history of the NASL. But he said, I'm trying to see this league survive. And if, if I can't set an example, uh, I would be wronging the league. So he said, I'm going to tell you that we're going to have restricted budgets for players and salaries. And he said, I'm going to tell you that all I want from you is two things. I want the team to be competitive and I want, I want them to be well-disciplined. And uh, <clears throat> without getting into a lot of detail, I think uh, that was the undoing of Ron Newman was the, was the discipline factor. Uh, the player's behavior. Anyway, without without getting into that, I I inherited some wonderful people: Kenny Cooper, Roy Turner, Bobby Moffitt, uh, Kyle Rowe Jr., uh, Charlie DeLong, a reserve player that I uh, drafted out of college. I mean, I had some wonderful people there that really paid it forward, working in the community and building the sport and selling the sport. And I was, I was probably perfect for that club at that time because I was developing, I was a teacher, trained teacher, and I was developing this, uh, this uh, workshop for youth coaches, uh, trying to help them understand that the game is for fun first, not for their personal gain or the parents' personal gain. And uh, I preached that to, to a lot of choirs in in Dallas and all around the the southern part of the United States in those days, but but anyway, um, we were competitive. We were never 
embarrassed. We were always competitive. Uh, we won our division a couple a couple of those years, uh, early years. Uh, I turned to the first year we did extremely well when I got there, and uh, we were we were had to fight Tulsa and and Minnesota. Minnesota had a great team. Freddie Goodwin, big time coach from Birmingham City in England, had come over and brought some of the players over, and, and he had great players. And and so <clears throat> uh, I was comfortable. Lamar was comfortable, and the players were comfortable. However. During that period of time was the Cosmo, what I consider the Cosmo era, and that is when the Cosmos brought in Pelé and all stuff started happening. And in order to compete, you are not thinking about, well, I need to compete with Tulsa. I need to compete with the Cosmos. So it was not a question of going out and buying the world all-stars. It was a question of finding a, finding a country where the players were not so expensive, where you could get first-line young players. And at that point in time, Brazil and, and, and Argentina and Chile were, the, were the, probably the solutions. And I started going in that direction and bringing some players in. And I always loved German players. It comes from my days with Detmar. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Germany with him when he was the manager of Bayern Munich. And I studied Eintracht Frankfurt, uh, spent a lot of time with them and their coach. And so I knew a lot about the German players, and I loved their discipline. I loved their skill level, etc. I always said they were Brazilian players, with uh, not quite as much flair and skill, but lots more discipline. And so I started, uh, uh, in order to be competitive, I started to bring some players in from Germany. And we built a team there that was very formidable. And in my last season there, I ended up uh, losing to the Cosmos. And here's, here's the story of how I lost. One, we play at home the first game. We are winning 2-1 with like eight minutes left in the game. I had a young American center back by the name of Steve Petcher who was an unbelievably good American defender and really competitive. And he gets into an argument with the referee over a call and thought that he was he was uh, being challenged by the referee and starts verbalizing with him and lost his concentration. And in that short period of time, that's all Canalia needed. And Canalia scores two goals and we lose 3-2 at home. Well, that sounds like we're done. We go to, to Cosmo land, to the Meadowlands, and we beat the Cosmos 3-0 in front of 77,000 people. Probably the best win I ever had in my coaching career. Uh, my German players say it was one of the greatest games I'll ever remember being in. And at the end of the game, I don't know if you know the story about this or not, Tim, but at the very end of the game with about three minutes left, the Cosmos get a corner kick against us. My center forward, who's Omar Gomez, it was a 23-year-old, the leading goal scorer in Argentina, first division that I had purchased. He had, he had scored a goal and made Carlos Alberto look pretty silly. And, and so uh, Carlos Alberto sneaks up behind him and jams his foot behind his knee and does his knee. Bro- medial co- collateral ligament. Boom. He's out. We got to play a mini game. And there's Gomez laying on the training table as we come in to the locker room to get ready to go out for the mini game. And, and the rest of the story is we lost. Uh, I was devastated. I was I was angry at at the happenings the way it happened. Uh, no one saw it. Uh, no, uh, allegedly, no nobody caught it, etc. I'm complaining. No one's hearing me, etc. And so 
that was that was my last game in Dallas, and and it was probably the best team I I had had to date, and it was a tremendous for me it was a tremendous moral victory to be able to go into New York back in those days with playing against that team and beating them three nothing. I was actually at that game, so I, I, I were you really? I don't say I vividly remember it, but I do remember some of the chaos and some of the. Uh, it just it's it seemed like it kind of went from wow that game just didn't you know from a Cosmos fans perspective right we, we just got completely pasted, uh, but then the fact that the mini game came about it's almost like you can kind of just sort of brush it away. But uh, no, did not know sort of the extent to that injury, uh, and yeah, frankly yeah. How, how serious that was in 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 your performance or enabling your performance in the, in that, uh, that 30 yeah. minute mini game. Uh, Carlos, Carlos came into our locker room after the game and said to me, I apologize. I had to do it. We had to win. And I said, get out of my side. Cause I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and he left, <laughs> but, uh, it was just one of the, I mean, it, it, it's, it spoke volumes about soccer on a world level. When you're in the world cup, it doesn't matter. There are no laws. There are no rules. You have to win at all costs. He had experienced that. He grew up in that environment. He lived that environment. And I saw it firsthand. All right. You know what? We're going to uh, we're going to stop the conversation there and uh, we're going to go into another uh, uh, part of it. Uh, the second part of it. Uh, the conclusion, if you will, uh, next week uh, with our uh, our very special guest, Al Miller. I thought that was a good place to stop. Uh, very interesting story and anecdote never really heard before uh, about the uh, late uh, and great uh, Carlos Alberto, a legendary uh, player for Brazil and, and Santos. Uh, but of course, with the New York Cosmos uh, during the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And uh, very interesting. I, having been in the stands at that game, uh, remember uh, yeah, fairly well the uh, the sort of uh, dual-headed nature of that that afternoon. Uh, that is a three nothing spanking, if you will, by the tornado uh, of uh, the Cosmos uh, in the regular game to tie the series up, and then the mini game, which basically just is a thirty minute sort of free for all, and um, uh, just very interesting the tactics uh, that sort of uh, came down on all that stuff, and uh, you know the intensity, right? And uh, you know. Uh, uh, Playing the Cosmos always an intense kind of uh, experience, and uh, and and with a quality coach like Al Miller, uh, you know, uh, you know, you can you can understand the passion and the uh, uh, and the intensity uh, of a game such as that. And, and most fans of the North American Soccer will remember some of those uh, uh, just wild uh, and and very tension filled, uh, strangely, uh, playoff matches and series and and uh, concoctions, if you will, with mini games and shootouts and all that kind of stuff. Um, anyway, so we're going to be, uh, and we didn't even get, we only got to scratch the surface. We didn't even get into, uh, some of the, uh, the, the later years with the Dallas tornado. Uh, you're going to be, uh, really interested to hear, uh, in our, uh, our second uh, piece of this, uh, this conversation next week, uh, the, the interesting stories around, uh, the Calgary boomers, uh, which were sort of a one year plus, uh, interesting little story or footnote, if you will, in North American Soccer League history. We also get go back into um, some indoor soccer roots uh, that we didn't talk about in this uh, this part of the uh, the conversation. But uh, you're going to be uh, fascinated to hear sort of the uh, what many soccer purists uh, consider to be the sort of first modern day uh, game of indoor soccer played here in the United States in Philadelphia. Uh, it was Al's team with the Philadelphia Adams. Uh, that got that game going uh, and that sport going and you, interesting stories there. That's all next week. So uh, please uh, set your podcatchers to uh, to that. And uh, we look forward to having you back next week. Uh, we want to thank before we run our friends at Podfly Productions, as always, uh, the good Dr. Jerry Payne. Uh, he uh, uh, of uh, tremendous uh, capabilities and talents, putting our pieces together every week and making a sound as uh, halfway decent as we do. Podfly.net is a great place to get your uh, your podcast uh, stuff checked out and uh, if you're interested in being a podcaster yourself you will uh, find no better source than podfly productions that's podfly.net okay uh, don't forget to follow us on uh, twitter at good seat still follow us on uh, instagram at good seat still available 
Uh, you will find us on uh, Facebook as well. And of course, our website, goodseatsstillavailable.com. Go there early, go there often. Please rate and review us. We uh, that, that gets it gives us heat for the show. Other people will find it. Uh, keep your cards and letters coming, as they say. And uh, until next week with our part two with Al Miller, we uh, bid you all a fond adieu. Thanks for listening. And we'll, uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>